Well, let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. As we enter Galatians chapter 4 this morning, Paul is continuing to correct and encourage these believers in the churches in Galatea because they were turning away from God to follow the false teachers. The false teachers said the way to God is by works for God. These believers were trying to earn God's approval, acceptance, and blessings by doing the works of the law, by working for God. This was a huge problem. Say huge problem. This was a huge problem for these believers because apart from Jesus Christ, no one can obey all the law all the time for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's impossible for us to work our way to God. And Paul knew this better than anyone based on his background, experience, and expertise in Judaism. Paul taught the way to God was by God's grace through faith in Jesus. Paul taught the law and the promise work together in God's plan to point us to Jesus. The law demanded perfect obedience to God. The law revealed everyone's sin against God. The law sentenced everyone to death apart from God in hell. The law also pointed to the promised seed and Savior who would come, that being Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth, and he perfectly obeyed and fulfilled all the law for us, and he is able to open the door of the prison of our sin and allow us a way of escape because of his life, death, burial, and resurrection, because of his finished work on the cross of Calvary. We are right with God by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus. This is the good news of the gospel. We must continue to share the gospel of Jesus today because people today still believe being good and doing good is enough to get them to God. We must share the good news of the gospel of Jesus because We know today, just like Paul knew years ago, the only way into a relationship with God is by faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. This was what Paul was sharing here in chapter 3. Paul ended chapter 3 on a high note. As we finish chapter 3 last Sunday, we see that Paul was sharing with us that the law was our guide, our tutor, our guardian. The law was given to show us our sin and our need for the Savior Jesus. The law said, this is what God wants, so not to do it is sin. And so we know the law helped us to get to God because the law showed us our need for the Savior Jesus. Paul said the law watched over us until Christ. It pointed us to Christ. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. The Holy Spirit is our guardian, our tutor, our guide. We are sons and daughters of God by faith in Jesus. Paul said that the Holy Spirit, God, when we were saved by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into Christ. God placed his Holy Spirit in us at the moment of our salvation, and we were baptized, we were immersed, we were supernaturally placed in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God at that moment of salvation. We know that our salvation is a miracle of God's grace, love, and mercy poured out on us in Christ. We are right before God in Jesus. This is our position. If you're taking notes, make sure you write this down. We are right before God in Jesus. This is our position. We are positioned in Christ Jesus with God. But Paul also said that not only we be baptized with Christ, but we were clothed with Christ. That word clothed means we put on Christ. So Christ Jesus in us, and we are in Christ Jesus means the Holy Spirit of God clothed us with Christ. The same power that conquered the grave lives in you and me. We can do all things through Christ because he strengthens us. And so we are right with God in Jesus. That's our position. We're to live right before others through Jesus. That's our practice. You see, the difference Christ makes in us is to be seen through us. And the first place this difference is to be seen through us is within our family, both our immediate family, husbands and wives, children, our immediate family, but also our family in Christ Jesus, our brothers and sisters in Christ, because we are family in Jesus. Turn to your right real quick and turn to your left. These are your family members in Christ Jesus. They're your family. Whether you want them or not, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. 
We're family in Christ Jesus. And Paul reminded us of this in verse 28. Paul wrote, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul reminded us that God doesn't have favorites. Our race, Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, our socioeconomic status, slave or free, with a lot or with a little, our sex, male and female, it doesn't matter to God as it relates to salvation, for we are all one with God by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And we're to love one another like Jesus, but also we're to walk in obedience to Jesus. And so he finished chapter 3, Paul finished chapter 3, reminding us that we are heirs of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we are Abraham's descendants. We are Abraham's spiritual children in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we have received the promise of God. We are heirs according to the promise of God. That means we've received God's blessings through Abraham by faith in Jesus, the promised seed of Abraham. And so he now transitions and welcomes us into chapter 4. We're making our way into chapter 4 this morning. And Paul wrote these words. Now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. So right here we find out what Paul is doing as he is using an analogy here in these first few verses of a child transitioning into adulthood. Much like he used in chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. And he's using this analogy to make a spiritual point. He's using this analogy, to, quite honestly, to challenge and correct these believers who had turned away from God and they were trying to work their way to God. They had turned away from God and they were following the false teachers. And he was using this analogy to rebuke and correct these believers and tell them to turn back to God and to continue living by the freedom and grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. And so he writes these words, now I say that as long as the heir is a child, an heir is one who receives or is entitled to receive a blessing, a gift, or an inheritance, usually from a parent, family member, or loved one. So he says, now as long as the heir is a child, child means infant here. The word in the original language means infant. It means not of age. It means unskilled, untaught. It means one who is not walking or talking yet. It was used in Scripture to, de to define and describe young, young infants from the age of birth to about four years of age. So Paul says, now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he's talking about an heir, this heir is a child, the heir is a child, he's so young that he cannot care for himself or his assets. It's too young. Child, here in this original language, as Paul used throughout the New Testament and other authors, this word child can also refer to one who is spiritually immature, one who is a babe in Christ Jesus. So he says, now I say, that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave. A slave was someone who belonged to another. A slave was someone who didn't have any rights. They were completely dependent on others. So as long as the heir is a child, the heir is not any different from a slave in that the heir is dependent on others. The heir doesn't have any rights. They can't take control of their rights. He said, though he is the owner of everything, Though the heir is the rightful owner of everything, though the heir is the rightful owner of the blessing, gift, or inheritance, the heir is too young still. He is too young to take possession, control, and authority of the inheritance, of the blessing, of being an heir. So as long as the heir is a child, the heir is much like a slave. It doesn't differ because the child, this heir who is a child, is dependent on others, completely dependent on others. He continued, instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. He said, instead, since this heir is a child, since the heir is dependent on others, he said, he is under, that means he is under the authority, the leadership, the control, the mastery of Guardians and trustees. Guardians and trustees. Guardian, if you remember from our study a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, uh, last week in particular, 
guardian means someone who is hired, a trustworthy person, oftentimes even a, a trustworthy slave, who was hired by wealthy Greeks and Roman families to watch over their children, specifically their sons, to make sure that they transition from childhood into adulthood. This guardian would go everywhere the son went, the child went. When it went to school, the guardian would go with them, sit in the classroom. Came home, the guardian would watch them all the way home. When the guardian was in the home, the guardian was there watching over the child. When the child went outside the home, the guardian was there watching over the child. The guardian would teach the child, train the child, even had authority to discipline the child, to discipline the son, because the goal for the guardian was to make sure that child, that son in particular, was able to make it to adulthood. He also says they were under Guardians and trustees. Trustees is a new word. Guardians is similar to the word used in chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. Trustees is a new word. Trustee literally meant the manager of the household. The trustees were the ones that wealthy families would hire, and they would basically run the household. They would set the rules for the house. They would set the rules for the children. When the children would get up, when the children would go to bed, what the children would eat, when the children would eat, when the child would go to school, when the child would come back home, when the child would do work, when the child would be able to have free time to play. The guardians would follow and carry out the rules of the trustees in these homes. So he's saying instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Remember, as we shared, the father in the house was the one who would set the time when the child would officially transition into adulthood. It was the father who would set the time. And whatever time that father decided to set, that was when the, when the child got to that age. That's when it was official and the child would transition into adulthood. And when the child transitioned into adulthood, they no longer needed the trustees or the guardians. They were free. Because they were an adult. No longer needed the trustees and guardians. The fathers would set this time, and we see in our study of history, especially these cultures in Paul's day, that when this time of passage happened, there would oftentimes be a big celebration that went along with the passage from this child to go from childhood into adulthood. Scholars tell us for the Jews, it's age 13, and they celebrate with the bar mitzvah. For the Greeks, it was around age 18. For the Romans, it was around ages 14 and 15. And each of those cultures had their own celebrations when the child became an adult. And so he's sharing this comparison. When the heir is a child, he's under the guardians and the trustees. And then he continues uh, in verse 3. In the same way, here we go, in the same way we also, say that with me out loud. In the same way we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. Paul now is making the comparison, a spiritual comparison here with verses 1 and 2, so that he can drive home this point that he is making, the spiritual point. He said, in the same way we also. That means even so we, so also we. Now, you want to highlight we here because when Paul said, in the same way we also, he was including himself. So he's writing to these believers, the Jewish and Gentile believers in these churches, and he includes all of them, but he also includes himself. And he says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, so he uses that same word again from verse 1 and 2, he said, when we were children, he's focusing in and saying, in the same way, we, all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ right now, when we were children, specifically he's pointing back to before they came to faith in Christ Jesus. When we were children, before we came to faith in Christ Jesus, when we were too young to understand our sin and need for the Savior Jesus. It also has a relation to when they were very new in their faith in Christ Jesus, when they were spiritually immature. But he's focusing in on when we were children, before we placed our faith in Christ Jesus, we were in slavery. That means we were in bondage. We were confined. We were imprisoned. We were shut up in slavery 
under the elements of the world. So Paul said, when we were children, remember guys, he's writing to these believers, remember guys, remember my brothers and sisters, Jews and Gentiles, when we were children, before we placed our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, we were in bondage, we were in slavery, we were imprisoned under the elements of the world. Elements means rank. It means the ABCs of something. Elements literally means the rules that determine and guide behavior. So he's saying before we placed our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, we were under the control and bondage to the rules that determined and guided behavior, the elements of the world. World is a reference to this fallen world that we live in, this world that is under the control, power, influence, and sway of the evil one, Satan. It's this world that is led by Satan and his demonic forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the elements of the world include the beliefs, the messages, the philosophies, the thoughts, and the people in this world who are living in opposition to God and in rebellion against God. Before Paul said we were Children, before we came to faith in Christ Jesus, we were in bondage to our sin. We were in bondage. We were under the control of uh, the messages, the beliefs, the philosophies, the thoughts, the people of this world who were living in opposition to God and rebelling against God. Paul reminded these folks that the Jews were in bondage to the law and the works of the law that they believed would ultimately get them to God. The Gentiles were in bondage to the many different pagan religions of the day which were all focused on works, doing all these works that the pagan religion required in order to get to God. So Paul is bringing this comparison to the forefront, and he said, guys, before we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, before we trusted in Jesus as our Savior, we were just like the heir who was a child under guardians and trustees. We were under the power and control of the law and the pagan religions. We were dependent on the law and the pagan religions to get us to God. We were separated from God by our sin against God. Paul was trying to help these believers understand in following the false teachers, in trying to earn God's approval and acceptance by their works for God, they were living like they used to live before they placed their faith in Christ Jesus. In trusting in religion and the works religion requires us to do in order to somehow try to earn a relationship with God, they were living as those who were spiritually immature, those who were babes in Christ Jesus and who had not yet learned the fullness of this grace of God in Christ Jesus. They were actually living as those who didn't even have a relationship with God in Christ Jesus. So best case scenario, Paul is saying that you were living, you were living because you you are following the false teachers, you're trying to earn your way to God by your works for God, I mean, at best, you are living like immature infants in Christ Jesus rather than mature adults in Christ Jesus. So you're living like you lived before you even came to faith in Christ Jesus. Again, he's concerned for these believers. And then he brings it to us in verse 4 and verse 5. Look at this passage. Paul said, in the same way, when we also, we also, when we were children, we were under the slavery, under, we were sla- in slavery under the elements of the world. Now he said, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. This is the good news of the gospel. Amen. This is the good news of the gospel. Now, understand, he shows the comparison in verses 1 through 3 of what they were before they came to faith in Christ now and how they were living. Now he's going to make that comparison beginning in verse 4. He said, when the time came to completion, just like the father who was the one in the families who determined the time when the children and the son in particular would transition into adulthood, Paul's taking this analogy and he said, When the time of completion, when the time came to completion, that means in the fullness of time, when God said it was time, when the time God set before the foundation of the world came to be, God sent his son. 
God sent his son. God didn't send his son. Make sure you understand this, what Paul is saying. God didn't send his son because he was mad at his world. God didn't send his son because he was discouraged by his world. God didn't send his son because he was frustrated with us as his world, as his creation. No, 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 no. God sent his son at the perfect time, the right time, which was his time. And that means God is going to send his son back for us at the perfect time, the right time, which is his time. And we need to understand God sent his son. Now, what Paul is emphasizing here is God sent his son. Say his son. His son. God sent his son. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying this. Jesus is God's son. God sent his son. Jesus is God's son. What does this mean? It means this. Here's the key point for us this morning. Jesus is fully God. God sent his son. His son. Jesus is God's son. He is fully God. Now watch this. Watch this. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, Jesus. He is fully God, born of a woman. Woo, this is good. He was born of the Virgin Mary. That means Jesus, God sent Jesus his son when the time was right, and Jesus is God's son. He is fully God, but he was also born of Mary, the Virgin Mary, which means Jesus is what? He's fully man. Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. He's a perfect God man. Jesus is fully God. He fulfilled all the law for you and for me. He was tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. He and he alone was able to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins because Jesus is fully God. But listen now, Jesus is fully man. He became like us. He took on flesh like us so that he could become the substitute for us. You see, Jesus became like us so he could take our place on the cross and pay our price for sin. And he said, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, get this now, born under the law. Remember, the law demands obedience, obey all the law all the time. The law imprisoned all of us. The law shut up all of us in the prison of sin because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God, at the right perfect time, his time, sent his son, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, born of a woman. He was born under the law. He was born under the law like us, but he fulfilled the law perfectly for us so that he could provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins because that was the whole point. God sent his son to earth in the first place because as we continue to read, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, to redeem those under the law. That's you and me. To redeem those under the law. Jesus is our redeemer. We have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Jesus redeemed us. That means he purchased our freedom from sin, Satan, and death by his perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus bore the punishment for our sins on the cross of Calvary for us. Jesus took our curse, and he gave us his blessing. And we stand before our almighty God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We stand clothed in his righteousness, not before God by our works or what we've done. No, but before God, washed in the blood of Jesus, dressed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And he said when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law. Get this now. This is so good. So that we might receive adoption. So that we might receive what? Say that again. What? Adoption. So that we might receive adoption as sons. Adoption means to be brought or placed into a family which you were not naturally born. Adoption means to be placed or to be brought and put into a family in which you were not naturally born. We have been adopted by God and placed supernaturally into his family by his grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. That means we are sons and daughters of God. Get this, that means we are heirs of God. And we are recipients of all the blessings of God that he has for us in Christ Jesus. Man, that's a hallelujah moment, amen? Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Amen. We are adopted. We've been adopted by God. Though we turned away from God in sin and disobedience against God. We were spiritually dead in our sins and transgressions. We had no way of getting to God on our own. Almighty God, when the time came to completion, he sent his son Jesus to earth. And Jesus rescued us by his finished work on the cross of Calvary so that we now can be adopted. We can be placed into God's family by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And as heirs of God, we receive all the blessings that come to us as children of God. And he continues in verse 6 and tells us one of those blessings. He said, and because you were sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So Paul reminded these believers in us that one of the blessings of God that we receive as heirs of God and children of God is the Holy Spirit of God. When God saved us, he placed his Holy Spirit in us. Now understand, what well, Paul is reminding, he's sharing with these folks, he's written, he's written this letter to these folks. These words are to be read by these folks, helping them to turn back to the Lord. And Paul was reminding them, when God saved you, he placed his Holy Spirit in you. Hey guys, remember, the Holy Spirit of God is the one who convicted us of our sin and need for the Savior. The Holy Spirit is the one who drew us into a relationship with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who baptized us into Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who has clothed us with Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to live for Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables and helps us to be able to cry out to our Abba, Father. Abba, Father is a phenomenal expression here in the Word of God. Abba, Father, is a term. It's a warm term of intimacy, of a personal, deep relationship with our Father God. Abba literally means daddy. Daddy. You know this as well as I do as a parent. Daddy is one of the first, it's one of the first words a child learns to say. Daddy. And so what Paul is sharing with these believers is, guys, you're living as you used to live before you came to faith in Christ. Remember all that God has done for you in Christ Jesus, how you've been adopted into his family. And oh, by the way, God placed his Holy Spirit in you. And you have all these blessings from God by, based on the Holy Spirit. And oh, by the way, it's the Holy Spirit who is the one who lives within you. And it's the Holy Spirit is the one who encouraged you to cry out to your Abba Father, your loving Daddy, every day in every way. And this is one of the blessings of God that we receive as heirs of God. We have been adopted into God's family, and so we have all the rights and privileges as children of God. We receive all the blessings of God, and one of those blessings means we can call and cry out immediately right now, every day, all through the day. We don't have to wait. We don't have to go through some process. We don't have to pass a whole bunch of classes. We don't have to get a degree. No, we can go right to our Almighty God, and we can cry out to our Abba Father, our loving Daddy, at any point in time. We need His help. We can cry out to Him knowing that he hears us, and he's there to answer us. And Paul continued here, and he said in verse 7, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. He's saying, guys, remember this. You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. He says, you're no longer a slave. He's saying, listen, guys, remember, you are no longer in bondage to sin. You are no longer confined under the law. You are no longer dependent on guardians and trustees. You are no longer separated from God because of your sin against God. You have been adopted by God into his family. You are sons and daughters of God by God's grace through faith in Jesus. You are free in Jesus to live and love like Jesus. He says here, so, but as a, you are, so you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son then God has made you an heir. He reminds us we are heirs of God and co-heirs in Christ Jesus. And as heirs of God, as children of God, we are recipients of all the blessings of God. Paul reminded these believers of all that God had done for them in Christ Jesus in the hopes that they would read these words, be convicted by the Holy Spirit, understand the error of their way, Turn away from their works. Turn away from the false teachers. Turn away from living as if they did before they came to faith in Christ or living as, as infants in Christ Jesus, babes in Christ, missing the blessings of the grace and freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus. And he was hoping that they would then turn back to God, 
confessing their sins to him, and then once again enjoying the freedom and the grace and the victory that is theirs in Christ Jesus. And so Almighty God spoke these words through Paul to these believers years ago. He says the same things to you and me today. When the time was right, he's saying this to you and to me, every one of us individually and to us collectively. When the time was right, God sent his son Jesus to earth. Jesus came to this earth and he was born of Mary, humbly in the manger in Bethlehem. He's fully God. He's fully man. And he was born under the law. He was born under the law like us, but he perfectly obeyed and fulfilled the law for us. Why? Because he wanted to redeem us. He wanted to rescue us. He wanted to save us. See, the purpose of him coming was to purchase our freedom from sin, Satan, and death by his work for us on the cross of Calvary. Yes, he knew why he came. He came to redeem us. He came to offer himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And in so doing, we now have the privilege of being adopted into God's family. We've been adopted into God's family by God's grace through our faith in Christ Jesus. That means we're sons and daughters of the King. We're children of God. We're heirs of God. By God's grace through our faith in Christ Jesus, we receive now all the blessings of God. You do and I do in Christ Jesus. And one of those many blessings is we now have the joy and privilege each day throughout the day. We can cry out to our Abba Father. We can cry out to our loving Daddy. We can cry out to our good, good Father every single day. We are heirs of God. And we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We have every blessing in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness of sin in Christ Jesus. The grace of God in Christ Jesus. Unlimited strength in Christ Jesus. Patience and perseverance in Christ Jesus. Joy and kindness and gentleness in Christ Jesus. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So what's our application? What does God want us to take away today? It's real simple. We need to live by faith in Jesus. That's what he was telling these believers. That's what he's telling us today. We need to live by faith in Jesus. Our faith in Jesus, listen now, our faith in Jesus demonstrated by our obedience to Jesus allows us to experience the blessings that are ours in Jesus and it allows us to walk in the victory that is ours in Jesus. Remember, our faith in Jesus demonstrated by our obedience to Jesus which these believers were not demonstrating, our faith in Jesus, demonstrated by our obedience to Jesus, allows us, opens the floodgate for us to experience all the blessings that are ours in Jesus and to walk in our victory in Jesus. You see, these believers weren't walking in their victory in Jesus. They weren't experiencing the blessings of Jesus. They were dealing with burdens and discouragement and all kinds of challenges because they weren't walking in obedience to Jesus. They weren't demonstrating their faith in Jesus. They had turned away from God, and they were following the false teachers. Listen, living by faith in Jesus simply means this. Living by faith in Jesus, you can summarize it in this simple nutshell. Living by faith in Jesus means getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Living by faith in Jesus means getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Will we face difficulties, struggles, sufferings, trials, times of pain? Yes. Will God call us out of our comfort zones of familiarity every day to get out onto the waters of faith? Yes. Will we face the battle of spiritual warfare on a daily basis, yes. Do we have an enemy who is prowling around us like a roaring lion, looking for just the right time to devour us? Yes. Will we battle with the sinful fleshly desires that wage war inside us on a daily basis? 
this. But when these times come, Paul's reminded us again this morning that we can call out to our Abba Father. We can ask for his comfort, for his encouragement, for his endurance, for his forgiveness, for his grace, for his hope, for his love, for his peace, for his strength, for his wisdom, for his knowledge, for his understanding, for his help. And as we cry out to our Father, we know he loves us. He is with us. He is watching over us. He's working in us, through us, and around us for his good purposes. And we know he will hear us and he will answer us and he will strengthen us by his Holy Spirit in us to live his way day by day. You see, without faith, it's impossible for us to please God. And as you look in the scriptures from cover to cover, you're going to see all throughout the scriptures, the men and women that God used in the scriptures, he said the same thing to each one of them. Go, go, go. Follow me by faith. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You can't stay where you are and continue to go and grow with me. Go. And as we go, we know that we go with our loving Abba Father watching over us, ready to help us, strengthen and encourage us at a moment's notice as we cry out to him. See, these false teachers, and quite honestly, the world today, says the way to God is by religion. The world says the way to God is by religion. The Word says the way to God is by relationship. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Amen? Amen. So let's call in the name of Jesus today. Let's enjoy all of our blessings in Jesus today. Let's love one another like Jesus today. Let's pray with and for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus today. Let's walk in the victory that is ours in Jesus today. Let's tell others about Jesus today. And as we do, as Paul has shared with these believers, we know God says once again to us, as we live for Jesus, we think of all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, of all that he has done, He sent His Son, our Savior, to rescue us from our sins. As we consider all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, how He is at work in us through Christ Jesus, how can we not live and love like Jesus by the power of Jesus at work in us? Because we know one day, one day, very soon, we are going to spend eternity with Jesus. He sent his son at the perfect time once already. And he's going to send his son at the perfect time again for you and me to take us to glory. So let's live like Jesus and love, let's love others through Jesus by his power at work in us. Let me ask you to bow in prayer. Our worship team is going to come and lead in this time of response to the Lord. God's at work. He's speaking to us by his spirit in us. I want to encourage you to respond in obedience. I want to encourage you just to spend just a few moments just considering once again all that God has done for you in Christ Jesus. These scriptures are written for you and me this morning. What God did for us in Jesus. When the time was right, he sent his son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Why to redeem us? Why? Because God loves us. Why we are still sinners? Christ died for us. He paid our price. He took our place so that we could know him, but not just know him, so that we could live for him and through him in Christ Jesus. He is our Abba Father. He is our good, good Father. We are loved by him. And it's our joy and privilege as his heirs, as his sons and daughters, to live for him day by day in his strength for his glory. So we dwell on all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, that 
will produce in us a desire to worship Him, to praise Him, to thank Him. And then to join Him in His work of ministering to those around us. Our pastors, our ministers are standing here at the front. They would love to pray with you, pray for you. If you have a need, care, concern, they would love to join you in prayer this morning. The altar is open as it always is. Maybe you want to just come and kneel. Your husband, your wife, your family, your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ, and just rejoice in the Lord. Maybe God wants you to minister to someone who's hurting, going through a difficult time. This is our time to respond to the Lord in obedience to his voice to us. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then why not today? Why not right here? Why not right now? Once again, the gospel has been presented. Say yes to Jesus this morning. Receive the Savior and begin your new life in Christ, living for him this very day. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord together.